Hello and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. Before we get to today's guest, I wanted to make a quick recommendation for you. If you're listening to this podcast, I have to assume that you have an interest in reading great writing. You may be interested to know that each Thursday morning I send out a carefully curated email newsletter where I recommend great articles and books that I've recently read, as well as podcasts and music and links to my own recently published writing. This newsletter is called Dispatches, which I've been sending out each Thursday morning for about a year and a half now. If this sounds like something you might be interested in receiving in your inbox, the best way to sign up is to visit tinyletter.com slash Andrew McMillan. That's tinyletter.com slash Andrew McMillan, or alternatively, just Google Andrew McMillan Dispatches and it'll come up. Now, today's guest is Susan Johnson. Susan has recently published her eighth novel, The Landing, which takes its name from a fictional lakeside community north of the Queensland capital of Brisbane, where all of the 200 or so residents intimately know each other's business. In addition to her prolific fiction work, Susan has also published two non-fiction books, including a memoir, and she works as a staff writer at the Courier Mail's Saturday magazine, Q Weekend. I'm more familiar with her fine work in the magazine, but when we met at the News Queensland offices in mid-September, we spoke largely about her fiction writing. Our conversation also touches on her experiences with the shrinking sizes of author advances in recent years her early career as a cadet journalist at the Courier Mail, and how she later found her way back to the newspaper where she began. The hostility that creative people and artists tend to be met with whenever the topic of writer's grants are discussed in public, and how she wrote herself into existence with her first novel, after first meticulously deconstructing her favourite authors to better understand how they wrote. Introducing Susan Johnson, author and staff writer at Q Weekend. Johnson, welcome. Thank you very much. I am fascinated by how you have built a life around words. I'm always fascinated to meet people who have done so, and you have done so by moving between two genres, fiction and non-fiction, and you've just released your tenth novel, The Landing, which I finished reading a few nights ago. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. You are, I don't know, a few weeks after release. Tell me what's going on in your life as far as the promotion, the marketing of that book. Um, well, I'm working full time as a journalist. I, I work at Q Weekend magazine, which is the Saturday colour magazine of the Courier Mail in Brisbane. Um, so that's a full time job, and and essentially I've just had to take some time off to do a lot of the promotional work for the for the novel. I'm I've, I'm launched in Brisbane. I'm I've done a bit of national radio, and I'm going down to Sydney, Canberra, and Melbourne in the first week of October to do launch stuff there. Um, Benjamin Law is actually launching in Sydney, and and Ben got his start really at, at Q Weekend mm. um, through Matthew Condon, who who was the editor here, and now he's just a senior writer here, um, and his new book is coming out as well. Um, busy time. Yeah. Do you enjoy the process of once something is out there in the world, then you have to describe it and I guess sell yourself to potential readers? Yeah, I do, and I think you know any anybody who's a fiction writer is essentially an introvert. Um, you know, we, I'm, I'm very happy to spend a lot of time by myself, you know, and my definition of introvert is, you know, someone who regains their energy by being alone and recoups their energy, you know, by being by themselves. And an extrovert is someone who gains their energy, you know, through other people, by being with other people. So in a sense, um, you know, most writers are introverts, I think, and uh, I know when I first um, did my, my first novel when I was uh, in my late 20s, um, I, I thought the whole idea of having to do promotional stuff was just such anathema to me, anathema to me. it was a, a so the opposite of what I, I thought I could do mm. and in fact absolutely scared the bejesus out of me. So I actually had to go and do a public speaking course. Right. Um, which I did in Sydney at the Workers' Education Authority. And there were, all, there were people there who were doing various uh, courses for, for one woman had to do, it was the height of the AIDS crisis. She had to go to Paris. She was a, a senior scientist and, ad, and address um, an international congress. And, you know, public speaking 
really doesn't come naturally to people. I mean, it's it, we all know that you know the ten greatest fears. Public speaking is number one, followed by death. Mm. People would rather, you know, um, do anything, um, but including do dying. Yeah, including <laughs> dying. Exactly, exactly. So you know, it doesn't come naturally to me. But now I'm so seasoned, you know, because I've had years and years and years of it. Um, I, I just, I, I guess, I'm like an actor. I can go into pretend mode. You know, I mean, it's not actually my natural state, but I'm a practicing extrovert. I, I, I describe it as. Right. What are some of the common questions that you've learned? Uh, smart ways to deal with in an engaging manner when it comes to describing a fiction, work of fiction? Well, I, I think that you've got to, in the end, uh, most writers I know do their own uh, little um, prepping um, methods. You can just write down, as you do in media training or anything, you write down a few key points that you just keep coming back to. And it's very common uh, to be interviewed by people who haven't actually read the book. So you have to actually devise little, um, you know, quick... 30 or 50 second grabs where you can describe something. A novel is a complex, you know, big basket of ideas and it's it's very hard to reduce a novel to one or two words. And, you know, uh, like for example, even with my uh, blurb for this novel, most of the time the publisher asks you to do the blurb and... Because in theory no one knows it better than you do. Yeah, that's right. Even keeping your editor. That's exactly right. But, you know, the blurb um, that I came up with I think it was actually wrong for, for, for this novel because it doesn't actually encompass all the other characters. And it's a bit of a Trojan horse, this novel. It's not actually just about Jonathan Lott, it, this one male character. It's actually about a lot of other characters as well. So I don't know necessarily whether writers are always the best people to describe their work mm. you know um, I find it very very hard to compress the whole world of a novel of you know um, 80 hundred thousand words into one or two lines it's a tough ask mm. and uh, that decision back in your 20s to pursue that public speaking course was that your decision or did someone encourage you to do that? no 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 well I knew I, I just couldn't do it I mean I was so terrified of the idea of doing uh, standing up in front of people and, and also of, of um, doing live TV and radio and I've done quite a lot of live TV and radio now um, you know I'm still I, I'm still a person who, who much prefers to, to think and write rather than speak I think although I th I've got better at that but I but I, I don't think well on my feet I'm a person you know who suffers from esprit d'escalier I, I act always think of the perfect thing afterwards I'm not quick witted <coughs> some of my friends are um, and and that's good but I, you know I, I, I do I do think this kind of performing seal aspect of writing is is a bit unfortunate would you rather avoid it if you could I would actually, and I think most a lot of writers would. You know, if I could, it, it just think that you could just you know push the boat out, put push the the, the novel out there, and that would be it. Uh, that would be my preference. Hmm. There's only, I suppose, a handful of authors in the world who can get away with publishing something and then not talking about it. And not, do, not giving interviews. No, that's right. And and they're usually you know mega mega so like um, um, Salinger is a famous one. Um, Don DeLillo doesn't do a lot of um, Cormac McCarthy doesn't do a lot Happily. Uh yeah that's right that's right all those people but they're mega 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 um, you know big huge worldwide sellers there are some writers in Australia I guess that, that um, don't do a lot of um, publicity um, Jared Manane I suppose comes to mind um, David Ireland although you know I, I remember interviewing David Ireland as a young writer it, it, when I was in my 20s and you know he he, he doesn't mind a, a bit of you know publicity actually, um, it, it, he, but he just get, keeps getting rediscovered, forgotten and rediscovered, forgotten and rediscovered. Um, so it is an interesting question. Um, but I, in my experience, most writers I know would prefer not to do it. Yeah right. Well, let's backtrack a bit because I'd love to touch upon your whole career. Obviously, the landing is your most recent work and freshest in your mind, I suppose. Um, where did you grow up? Um, well, I was actually born in Brisbane. I've got a Queensland, I, I say I come from a mixed marriage. My father's a Queenslander and my mother's from New South Wales. So, um, uh, Dad was a journalist actually uh -huh. on the old Brisbane Telegraph and he got transferred to Sydney to, I guess, what used to be the Sun in Sydney. And so I was three months old um, when we moved back to Sydney and so I grew up in Sydney. So Sydney's my hometown. Um, on North Shore, um, well, well, they had the classic um, 
uh, rise, which you'll see throughout Australia, and mum and dad really kind of, and I've written novels about this, represented that, that kind of whole post-war boom in Australia. They started out in Cabramatta, which was then Gulf Whitlam's, um, its western suburbs of Sydney, the equivalent would be in Arla in Brisbane. Um, and, you know, they had a small little weatherboard and then they went up, you know, they, they moved to Brick, uh, North Shore, uh, Sydney, which is St Ives. So I went mm. to St Ives High School. Dad worked for an American company, he left journalism. And then, but he always wanted to come back to Queensland. So he actually left um, this big American company called 3M, which is Scotch Tape, um, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. And his choice was, um, you know, he had to go to uh, the States, really. He got transferred and, and, you know, he was national sales marketing manager. So it was a choice of going to America. And he always said he didn't want American kids or being staying in Australia. So he bought a pineapple farm at the age of 40. Mm. And we moved to Nambour High School. I went to Nambour. And I remember just the cultural difference of... Um, uh, we had a senior smoking room. It was Vietnam and, um, you know, I mean, I was only, you know, 13, 14, 15 when these things were happening. But suddenly to go to Nambour High School, where we had little hats and we saluted the flag every morning. And girls were in two streams, uh, academic or commercial. So mum and dad put me, I was in grade 10. Mum and dad put me into academic thinking, oh, you know, Susan will have to do academic. But... I was doing French, I couldn't do cope with French, so I got put into commercial, which mm. is bookkeeping, sewing, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, and then realised pretty soon, um, I was in the same year as Kevin Rudd, mm. but he was in the boys' academic the year. The former Prime Minister of Australia, just yes. in context, yes, for the international right. listeners. That's right. Um, and so then um, my parents bought a bigger farm and we moved to um, down to closer to Brisbane so I went to a girls school here Clayfield College and started my life in journalism here actually at the Courier Mail which was a, then a broadsheet and not owned by Murdoch hmm. um, it was owned by the Herald and Weekly Times um, so growing up with a, a journalist father at least for a time I'm guessing that reading and writing were valued in your family? They were. Dad had gone to um, the University of Queensland and studied literature and um, yeah he was always a fan. I mean that, that they they weren't great readers. I, I don't think my parents. Um, Dad was you know a fan of um, Wodehouse and um, a lot of American writers like Damon Runyon and things like that. He was a great fan of America my father in lots of ways. Um, but it wasn't a, you know, I wouldn't say it was an intellectual family, really. Um, you were attracted to reading at a young age? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my grandmother was a reader, my father's mother. And I do remember raiding her, um, you know, library when I was very young, like da her copy of David Copperfield. And uh, she had a lot of Dickens, a lot of Austen. So I was a reader from a very young age. And also wanted to be a fiction writer from quite a young age, um, but didn't really know how to, I think. Yeah. It's, it's sort of, you know, I, 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 like I think there's only a very few rare people like Truman Capote, Scott Fitzgerald, um, Tim Winton in Australia, um, you know, who begin their writing careers when they're, when they're very young. But in my experience, you have to am amass some sort of life experience. And I, I think much before 30, it's quite tricky. I can be done, mm. and you know the but but those examples I've given are all geniuses. You know they're just beautiful, beautiful writers. So, were you a good student? Um, I, I wasn't until my last two years, really. The girls' school. I mean, I'm a firm believer in um, academic single sex education for girls because it proves it doesn't make any difference for boys, but it does for girls. Girls do much better in in single sex education. If you can, why is that? Do it. Well, I, I just think that girls. I don't. I don't know. Actually, I'm not sure why they're. Well, there's role models for teachers. Quite often, there's good, you know, role models for for female of uh, female teachers. But also, I just think the distractions. Girls. I don't, look. I think this is changing because I think there are more girls going through universities than than boys now, and I think girls do better academically than in general. But um, you know, I think that that. Uh, girls can get a bit kind of um, distracted by boys and not don't want to compete with with boys in the same way 
so I don't know but so that was good for me I mean I'm sure I wouldn't have if I'd stayed in Sydney like most of my friends it was very much the you know puberty blues generation um, I don't think that I would have matriculated hmm. what were your best subjects in school in those last two years at Clayfield um, English you know I mean I was never a maths or science person but it's so English I remember winning some poetry prize um, for uh, independent schools and you know I mean definitely English I mean I was always kind of keen on on, um, on writing um, you know I, I was writing short stories I guess in my early 20s and I, I was quite keen on writing then but I just couldn't work out how to do it really um, and I was trying to write a novel but um, I just found it very difficult so you graduated, and uh, what was next for you? I actually didn't finish my degree. Oh, I meant high school. Oh, high school, yeah. And you went to... I went to University of Queensland. I did uh, journalism and English, but didn't finish my degree. I got offered a job in Sydney, um, which meant I didn't finish my cadetship as well. So I, I kind of, in those days, it was you were a cadet journalist, and they, you could go to university part-time. You didn't have graduate journal oh, we had one or two but you know it was the old days of um you could even have copy boys and copy girls that can't got through mm. they don't have that system anymore um although occasionally you'll see people who who will, will be um um kind of secretaries who get in um still mm. i think I, I, I well i don't know about still but i can think of one or two examples um, so I didn't finish my degree. I went, which had, I'll tell you, it had ramifications for me later um, as, as the kind of world changed. Um, uh, and I went to Sydney and worked for the Australian Women's Weekly under ITA. All right. Well, just to backtrack a bit, what time, or at what age did you begin the cadetship here at the Korean Army? I was a school leaver. Right. And uh, how was that? What was your first entree into that world it was incredibly uh, in those days incredibly um, tedious what, what cadets would have to do things like the shipping news you'd have to ring up and get you'd have to do the television program um, you would have to do a whole lot of rote things um, law court reports um, in a way it is quite good training because you know you really are starting quite low one of the the first things that the cadets had to do was go and do a in-depth report on the condition of public toilets in Queensland City in Brisbane City so we had to go and you know like I mean you know that that kind of incredibly tedious stuff but at the same time um, there was a, um, a mentor of mine here called John Hay who was um, a Scotsman who'd come to Australia years before there was David Rowbottom the the poet who was then the, the kind of arts literary editor you had a couple of you know really good old-time journos who um, would kind of be on the lookout for, for you know people who wanted to write and I was pretty much taken under the wing of the features editor who allowed me to write features pretty much from my second year in you know how did you make that known that you had those I don't know I don't know um, I think they used to look at what you wrote uh -huh. I think it was a question of them looking at what you were doing rather than the other way around. Hmm. Um, so they sort of put you on the deep end and throw you out on something. And if you came out with something interesting, they would, um, you know, give you a go, really. So I sort of got plucked out of the team. Um, there was me and a couple of other, you know, and it was a big thing to be put on features, you know, in those days. It still is, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's right. Because so, so I guess, you know, I was lucky. I was kind of mentored. He was a, you know a great teacher and you know you kind of taught yourself to write really I mean you would, it was very basic I mean I was doing journalism in, in um, but you know it was all that that very basic stuff of you know the why when inverted pyramid yeah approach. yeah yeah hmm. what did you learn from your mentors John and David um, I think they were they they kind of uh, really made me think about the link between kind of feeling and thought I think you know like it wasn't expressed in that way but it was about somehow putting something of a, a, an emotional 
quality in, into your work as well as, as kind of... Um, the facts. The facts, exactly. And I think that's the difference between a news journalist and a, a feature writer is the ability to kind of expand it from just explaining something that's going on into kind of the subtext mm. of what's going on in some way. Um, and that's always interested me. And in fact, as I wrote more and more fiction, as I went to Sydney, I left the, the Woman's Weekly after about a year. I travelled overseas for a year or two. I lived in Greece. I, um, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about writing then. And so gradually I started writing short stories. And so by the time I was in my mid-twenties, I realised that I had to get cracking with my, if I was serious about being a writer. And I got a very good job as... Um, there was a wonderful newspaper called the National Times, which lasted from, I guess, the late 70s to late 80s, maybe, um, which had fantastic journalists on it. I mean, I worked with David Marr, Adele Horan, um, Marion Wilkinson, um, uh, Kristen Williamson, um, Australia's best journalists, really, all worked at the National Times. And I, I mean, amazingly now, they gave me the job as Queensland correspondent, a Queensland editor, mm. and, you know, it was about 24. Um, you know, it was incredibly young, really, for, to, to get that sort of job. Um, so I came back to Queensland for a couple of years, and that was about the time that I thought, well, look, you know, I really do need to be serious about writing. Um, and so for me, what happened was, to get to that subtext thing, um, journalism seemed like to be the surface of things, but fiction seemed to be the truth of things. Uh, the, you know, the, the, like the truth of things seemed to be much, have far more weight and veracity than journalism. So it became a, like inverted for me that journalism seemed like not quite the made up stuff, but, but the kind of um, public face of things, which are not necessarily the true face of things. And what I was writing and, you know, fiction seemed much, much truer than journalism. So it became harder and harder for me to work in journalism when it seemed that, that fiction, and I still argue that, you know, that great fiction, Jonathan Franzen, um, Richard Ford, um, Helen Garner, great fiction, I still think has, a, has, has more of a capacity to tell you more profound things about the world than great journalism. And I know that's, that's a kind of big, big statement to make but I do think that's true hmm. just going back to that idea of mentors did uh, mentorship is a funny thing where it's kind of rare that people say I'm going to mentor you or can you mentor me it's kind of often an unspoken sort of thing where people gravitate toward each other and help help one another um, did you find that either of those two men John or David said to you I'm going to mentor you or was it only in retrospect that you No, that's right. I think that's right. I think in retrospect. But uh, it'd be interesting to ask John, actually. Um, I, I did feel very chosen by him, though. I, I, that was my feeling. So um, I'm not sure what his experience of that was, but I think you're right. I mean, now in writing, for example, the Australian Society of Authors has a formal mentorship program where you can put your, your name forward and, and mentor younger writers. And I'm always very conscious of the fact that I do like to... Um, mentor and um, promote, you know, the careers of younger writers. For example, if I'm ever asked to launch a book um, of, of, of a fiction writer, I will always try and and do that because, you know, I think it's pretty hard. I think it's harder than ever now, um, just because of the fractured media landscape and 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 the fractured publishing world. You know, things are changing so fast. I think people need all the support they can. And Matt Condon's been very good at, at kind of mentoring and putting forward um, the names of, you know, M M Miguela, Maguire, your work, um, uh, Ben Law's mm. work, um, you know, and I think that, 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 you know, that's part of your job once you get to a certain stage of your career to, to try and help other younger people coming mm. up. Yeah, definitely. The lights have just gone off in here. I must have forgotten about it. <laughs> I think sometimes if you move they... Um, yeah, just the way that you uh, you progressed quite quickly in journalism, like you said, you were editor yeah. of that in that role in 24, you must have been identified as a pretty serious talent for someone to give you that role. I well, I don't know. It's hard to know. I mean, I guess, I guess 
I guess what happened, um, like I was plucked out again when I worked at the Sydney Morning Herald. You know, when I think about those people that were there, when we, I was one of the, the inaugural team of writers, there were three of us, Anna Maria Deloso, Geraldine Brooks and me were the three feature writers on the Sydney Morning Herald Good Weekend magazine when, when it started. It wasn't a magazine, sorry, it was called Good Weekend. It was a Saturday section. So we're talking broadsheet days where Good Weekend was a separate section, um, you know, like a weekend section. And Valerie Lawson um, was in charge of it. So she was put in charge and we had this team. So again, that was before I went to... Um, uh, the National Times. So I was I was chosen by Brian um, Tui, um, asked if I wanted to go to the to the National Times from that job at the Sydney Morning Herald. So I think I think there's always been scope for younger writers to be you know kind of plucked out and and put you know to see how well you can do. Um, and I do remember it was a very wonderful job. You know we could actually write feature lengths, you know, up to, I, I guess it was only two and a half thousand words, something like that, because it wasn't magazine length. But, you know, you had a lot of scope to write. And, and you know, all three of us wanted to write. And Geraldine, of course, has had a spectacularly successful career. Um, she's gone on to win the Pulitzer Prize. Um, you know, she's a, she's a New York Times bestseller. Um, her father was American, so she had American... Uh, citizenship and she's she married um, an American she married someone whose family worked in publishing in New York so um, you know her career has been fantastic Anna Maria's um, raised she kind of decided to go and have children um, fairly early on and so devoted a lot of her life to to that and um, I think you know look look I think that there's in general for women I do think there's a very hard choice to to make. I think that having children does impede your career, no doubt. Mm. I think it definitely does. And I, ha I had my children very late. I had my children at 38 and 40. And that was a big decision for me to have children. And, you know, I, I think it's no accident that the majority of the world's finest female writers have, had, have, have been childless. Um, so I think it's a big thing you still have to make. Um, and in fact, I'm, I've just been reading at the moment um, the biography of Philip Roth by um, uh, Claudia Roth Pierpont, who's no relation, um, who's, who writes for The New Yorker. And in fact, Roth even, uh, Roth, Roth had no children, but he has also, uh, he feels as a writer, you have to choose life or art. And I was kind of interested to, to think that he, he he thinks you have to make that choice too, because I think you still have to make that choice in in, in some way. You, you know, it's it's a big demanding thing to write fiction if you have hopes to write de halfway decent fiction. It demands a lot, and I know it's not going down a mine. I know it's not brain surgery, but it is a difficult thing to write something of quality. You know, if you aimed, if you hope to write something of quality, it's mm. a hard thing. We're jumping around all over the place here. I'd like to come back mm. to the Women's Weekly. Mm. Tell me more about that role and uh, a bit of about Ita, what you learned from her. Well, see, again, I, I sent Ita some of my clippings. So um, you had the initiative to uh, pitch yourself or to I, sell I yourself. wanted to go to Sydney. I wanted mm. to leave Brisbane. Um, don't forget, this was, you know, pretty... This is Joe Bioku Peterson years. It was a lot of Queenslanders were leaving, um, and I certainly was on that. Um, I had a boyfriend who went to Sydney, and I wanted to go to Sydney too. Um, so I pitched my stuff to Aisha. Just Aisha? Or just um, Aisha. Uh, oh no, I would have pitched everywhere, but I but I, but to Aisha because um, Aisha and Aisha chose gave me a job without an interview, huh. just based on my full time work, job. A full time job wow. as a as a graded get D grade. So it used to work in those days. You do a cadetship and then you go a gradings. And D was the lowest. So basically, I got I, I jumped out of my cadetship into a graded position. But Anita, um, it was was actually very much those um, Cleo just after Cleo days, where she was, you know, the Packers were still around. You'd see see the Packers in the lift, and um, it was in Park Street in Sydney, so it's where Cleo was. And um, again, you know, um, I remember. For example, I remember interviewing people like um, Marilyn, um, the women's room, Marilyn French. I remember doing um, 
The Wave, the the movie of The Wave with Richard Chamberlain, which was um, a weir movie, a, an early weir movie. Um, I remember doing so. It was interesting days, the Woman's Weekly then. Um, there were a lot of... Jennifer Hewitt was there. Um, there was a, a lot of good journalists that were around. Um, and it was it wasn't just pap. You know, it was actually quite interesting in those days. We were doing, you know, much more interesting sort of feature stuff. Um, but I remember, you know, Aisha just, you know, having an interview with her. And these were the early days of feminism. I remember, I, I'm, to segue a bit, I'm, I'm quite hairy and I, I was not shaving my legs and I got called into the um, chief of staff's office to ask and ask to shave my legs because oh, really? I was representing the, the Woman's Weekly and I have to, you know, represent. And I remember trying to get a staff um, meeting, you know, to see if any of the staff would support me in my hairy legs, but everyone thought it was too trivial a matter. So I ended up shaving them. But, you know, with those days, you know, she was a pretty powerful figure then, Ita. Um, and, you know, I remember when I left, you know, she said, oh, well, you know, you could have a, a you know, a big career here. You know, you sure you want to leave? But I, I did, I, I remember resigning. In those days, you could chop and change. You could always think you could get a job anywhere. I mean, completely different media landscape than it is now. Did you fit easily into that world? Of, uh... Not really. Well, you know, the hairy legs. I was living in a, a communal house in Surrey Hills. We were all going to, you know, um, Queensland Right to March meetings. I remember people used to make big fun of me for working at the Women's Weekly. Really? My housemates, you know, they thought it was you know, very re revisionist. And I was already under suspicion for being, you know... Um, uh, like, I remember once someone saying to me, Oh, you, you, could, you can't be a feminist, you're too pretty. So they, they, were, it was, they were pretty hardline days. Mm. They, were, they were pretty hardline days, you know. And, you know, that was the days of lesbian separatism. It was the days of, you know, where, where women, um, you know, if you were sleeping with men, you were sleeping with the enemy. And, you know, it was, it was, so it was, it was hard working for the Women's Weekly, in, living in, in that household of, of all these Queensland lefties, you know. What, what year was this? What years were uh, these? So we're talking 78, 79. Um, you know, I shared a house with Marion Walkinson, Stuart Matchett from Triple Z. He was one of the original people at Triple Z, and then he went to Triple J. Um, you know, a lot of these people, they were, they were, you know, pretty hard line. Um, and so it was very embarrassing working for the Women's Weekly. <laughs> personally embarrassing or personally embarrassing having to ju uh, justify yourself to these friends of yours? Yeah, well... It was it was kind of not very cool working for the Women's Weekly. So it was personally embarrassing, but it was also embarrassing to justify myself. You know, it was very uncool working for the Women's Weekly, and and then uh, Marion was also working on Packer stuff then about the lizard. You know, the the you know the goanna. Um, you know, she was doing all that Nugent Hand stuff. Tell me more about that. Um, uh, Brian Chewy and Marion Wilkinson were working on a very very big investigation into this failed bank called Nugent Hand. Um, and there was some suggestion, um, and you might want to check this for live all, it was actually disproved because there's a Royal Commission that, that, that Frank, that um, not Frank Packer, but um, Kerry Packer was, um, the, the, this person referred to as the Goanna, which was, you know, he was basically alleged to have been involved in uh, money laundering and corruption, which was actually disproved in a subsequent Royal Commission. Um, but so they were, they were kind of, you know, days of um, Packer being under, under um, surveillance and scrutiny. Um, so I was actually working for Packer. So that was, you know, also you know, quite difficult. Um, mm. But there was interesting times, you know, it really was. Um, it must have been quite a strong character, strong personality to be standing up for yourself and being forthright and not taking no for an answer and not, um, I guess following the stream you were pushing against the stream well I don't think I was I think I'm you know it's very if you talk to any of those people about what I was like then I was very shy and timid and you know I certainly didn't I didn't have a lot of self-confidence um so I don't really think I was I just um I didn't quite know what else to do so leaving leaving you know journalism and going overseas and then trying to write I mean that was really I mean I always actually put it down to the fact that when I did right it was like I wrote myself into existence it was like I really I really felt that I developed my character and as a person I, I invested a lot in my writing life 
um, you know, I've, I've put a lot into that. And so, you know, to, to come full circle and to find myself back at the query mail where I began mm -hmm. at this vast late stage of my life, that's, I've had to eat a big slice of humble pie in a way mm -hmm. to do that because, you know, most people don't end up going back to where they started. You know, it's been quite hard for me to do that, um, you know, because I've, I've been sort of supporting as a, a writer of fiction for a very long time, 25 years. Um, and the reason I had to go back to journalism was I, um, I had a very acrimonious marriage breakup and my ex-husband has gone back to London. I, I mean, I've lived out of the country for a long time and he's not paying any child support. So I have two children that I'm paying, I'm supporting fully. And basically I can't support them on my uh, income from novel writing now. So I'm, I, I need a job. Um, so that's what I've had to do. But you know, it's been quite hard for me to, to go back to where I began. Uh, you know, like I've had to deal with a lot of, you know, sense of failure in, in doing that really. Um, because, um, you know, you, you don't, most people look at their lives as a kind of trajectory out and most people don't circle back <laughs> to where they began. So, um, you know, that, that has been quite difficult for me. Right, okay, well, we we'll might come back to that. Mm. I'd like to try and follow that trajectory. You went overseas and you wanted to write, write yourself into life, is how mm. you put it earlier, I yeah, think. Um, yeah. Who were your models? Who did you admire in terms of fiction writers, whether Australian or otherwise? Well, um, you know, my, my, my primary influence in Australia would have to be Helen Garner. I mean, I remember when Monkey Grip came out, um, buying a hardback copy of Monkey Grip, it would have been 1979 maybe or even earlier I'm not sure maybe 77 78 and I remember reading that and thinking god this is my life communal houses um the whole notion of um different kind of sexual politics um this is kind of the voice of us even though Helen Garner's a different generation to me she's much older I mean I think she's maybe 15 years older um I, I I very much was influenced by that. I, I read a lot of female writers around that time, you know, like I guess Erica Jong, um, Marge Piercy, Woman on the Edge of Time, uh, a lot of fiction coming out of England, which would have been Michelle Roberts, um, you know, a lot of Virago. Uh, you know, reissued Virago, of women's classics. So I read a lot of women. And I only started reading, you know, even though I'd started off with, I love Dickens, you know, I love uh, Hemingway. I used to love Hemingway. But I suddenly, I went through a period of just reading women writers. And that was the kind of, that was my template, you know. So when I came to write Messages and Chaos, which is set in Brisbane, I should give you a copy of that actually. Mm. Um, uh, I really was using the, the Helen Garner sort of monkey grip as my template in a way. So reading those women writers, were you filled with a sense of hope and optimism? Like, yeah, I want to do that. I really yeah, want to follow yeah, women. Yeah, totally. It wasn't totally. despair, like, how they're so good, I can't possibly follow them. No, in fact, what happens to me, um, I know that some writers... Um, do that. I, I, I think if you set that bar really high, the whole year I, I basically taught myself to write. I didn't do any um, creative writing courses or anything like that. What I did was I took apart as if there were clocks. I took apart the mechanisms of books. I, I, I studied Monkey Grip. I studied, which I think is the perfect novel, The Great Gatsby. I looked at how, what was the vehicle, what were they doing, how did they actually work as, as narrative devices, as plots, as, you know, so I, I taught myself, I, like the whole year before I started to write, I actually sat down and I took apart these books and R looked at how they, and deconstructing yeah, it. Right. yeah, and how they worked. And so I always think that, um, you know, when you've got really, really fine, great writers, rather than thinking for me, you know, how, how far I've got to go, what I find it does is sets the bar so high, I, it just makes me think, well, I mean, there's a wonderful quote by, um, by uh, Norm, Norman Mailer, who talks about really 
It's the, I think Ma- Mal is quite a fine writer too, even though he's kind of the opposite of, of all those kind of early women writers. Doris Lessing was a great influence too. The women's is so, uh, the, what is it? The Golden Notebook. That was a huge influence. Um, but um, Norman Mailer talks about adding another brick to the house of art. You know, that, that it's a big wall, everyone's building it. And even if you're tiny little brick is right down the bottom and of course you know we've got Tolstoy and we've got you know Joyce and all these and Jonathan Franz and you know all these absolutely marvellous writers it's all you can do is work your little part you know and and I'm okay about that I mean I I've got my own little territory I've got my own little plot and I've just got to work my own plot you know it, it, it you know you, it's it's very disheartening that I won't be Tolstoy. It's very um, disappointing to me that I won't ever write a book as, as beautiful as The Great Gatsby. But what I can do is I can write and perfect my own little patch. I mean, that's all you can do, you know. You, you, if you start to compare yourself in negative ways, you'll never, ever pick up your pen. You can't compare. All you can do is say, okay, this is my material. This is my own individual unique material and kind of work that into the best possible shape you can yeah what was the uh, process to getting your first book contract okay so that was another piece of luck I mean luck does come into it a lot too what when people say it's all you know a matter of uh, it, it's real luck you still need luck no matter what stage you're at you still need a great piece of luck and uh, uh, you know and, and also you need to, you, sometimes you're just in the right place at the right time. In this case I was, I had, I got, applied for a literature board grant. They wanted to give money to Queenslanders. In the in these days, we're talking 19, mid 80s. So I would have got my first $8,000 literature board grant in about 86, probably. Um, and that was a big vote of confidence for me. I thought someone thinks enough of my work to actually and I all, all I put in was about 10 short stories or something like that no no big long thing mm. someone think and I'd published them in, in obscure things like Hecate a women's inter, interdisciplinary journal that came out of the University of Queensland Carol Ferry was doing that a couple of small publications not you know big ones like Quadrant or um, Mianjin or anything like that small ones um, but that $8,000 gave me enough confidence to think right someone thinks I can do it I, I it gave me enough time and space I guess it's equivalent of 20 or 25 then um, to sit down and do it and I'd done all that work before of taking apart the you know I'd, wor- I'd left journalism I was working as a waitress you know because I, I knew I really wanted to to get this book done and then I realized um, I became um, a, a, a girlfriend of um, a, a wonderful writer called Tony Minatti who gave me this book called How to Write a Novel which was by John Brain uh, who wrote Room at the Top and basically he's it's a great uh, it's a still a fantastic uh, resource for anybody who wants to it's it's very clear it's very and one of the greatest things he said in that book is if, if you want to take the basket of of a novel of, of your favourite novel, the, the kind of structure. You can take the structure of a novel, but you don't take the words because that's plagiarism. But it's not plagiarism to take the structure of a novel. And suddenly something clicked in my head. I thought, that's absolutely right. You can actually use the same structure of something to put your own vehicle of things in. So once I had the structure, I was away. I had the novel. And then um, a, a friend of mine in Sydney, in fact, Anna Marie Deloso was contracted by a editor from Harper and Row, who was starting a new fiction list, Harper and Row Australia, and were actively looking for new novels. Mm. So Anna didn't have a novel, so she put me on to this uh, this editor, and the editor said, "Well, I'll, you know, when you finish, I'd love to have a look at it." So I finished it. I gave it to her. She loved it. And at that stage, I went in for the Australian Vogel Prize, okay? Uh, and I said, well, I'm sorry, you can't have it till, till the Vogel's announced because thinking, oh, it's so wonderful, I'll get... Okay, it wasn't even shortlisted. Uh-huh. 
Uh-huh. Okay, uh-huh. and the novel. So you, put, you put expectations and. Uh, yeah, I thought uh-huh. I thought this is will be you know because she'd like she'd loved it so I thought oh well it must be good, mm. and. I wasn't shortlisted, and I always tell this story that the woman who won in 1987 was a woman called Robin Walton, who wrote a, a, a collection of short stories called Glace Fruits, who has never published anything again. Hmm. So it's luck. So I always think I've had quite bad luck in my timing as well. If I had launched my whole career as the winner of the of Australian Vogel, I might have had a different career. I've ne- I've fallen out of. I'm too old for the David Maloof. I mean, I'm too young for the David Maloof generation of Queensland writers. I'm too old for the um, uh, John Birmingham's, the Nichols and whatever. I've got no uh, identity as a Queensland writer at all, despite my the fact that, you know, Messages and Chaos is set here. I've written quite a lot of Queensland novels. Um, I've written a a, a novel called Flying Lessons, which is set in um, North Queensland. I've got no identity as a Queensland writer at all. Um, And, you know, I've had, you know, in in one level I've had good luck in my career, but I've also had bad luck um, in that I, 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 I have never won anything. I've been shortlisted for everything going and I haven't won anything. I've been long listed for the International Impact Award. Um, I've been long listed for the Miles Franklin. I've been shortlisted for practically every award going. Mm. So my timing has just been a slightly out. You know, I would say arguably my timing has always been slightly wrong. I haven't actually managed to uh, to insert myself in the literary landscape so much. And I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a um, the pen um, anthology that Nicholas Joes did about Australian writing. And in the 20th century, women, women writers, um, in, a, in a section by Karen Goldsworthy, my work wasn't even mentioned. So, you know, I have a whole body of work that's not somehow attracted academic um, interest, mm. much to speak of. There's a couple of academics who, Professor Stephen Knight, who reviewed my first work, Denny O'Hearn, who's now died. Um, uh, there's another um, woman at the University of Armidale who's done some work on my... So I've, I've kind of slipped through the cracks of the Australian li- literary scene, really, in some ways, arguably, I think. Hmm. Hmm. Why do you think that is? Partly because I've lived out of the country, right. um, and but partly also because of just timing. I've... I've been in the wrong place at the wrong time. I've either missed out, missed the boat. I wasn't, you know, in the Kate Grenville kind of push. Um, or the other argument is that my, my work is just not quite off the stand. I mean, you know, if you wanted to talk about it um, in, um, in uh, harsh terms, you might get someone uh, out there who might say, well, it's not quite of the top order. I don't know. I mean, you know, who knows? Who knows? I mean, you know, I've, I, I do have um, some supporters who think that, um, you know, I'll, I'll be uh, picked up and my work will be, you know, revisited at some point. But you don't know. I mean, that's up to history. Mm. I might very well just be a B-grade minor writer as well. Who knows? Tell me about the moment of your first book being published. What was it like to have that in your hand, to, to see it? That was, well, that's the sweetest moment of all, I think. There's nothing quite like that. You know, it's, it's very, very sweet to have that. And you've got all your hopes and, you know, you're not, you haven't been disappointed. You haven't been, um, you know, it's a great moment. It's just the book itself, you know. And, and it's also, I mean, for me, it was a very great moment because um, I, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, it was a way of, uh, as I've said, writing myself into existence. It was a, a long cherished idea. It was published when I was about twenty nine, um, and it seemed like a really long road to get to get to it. And you know, it was really well received. I got really, really good reviews in that first year. It was picked up by Joan Lindsay as an option to make a film. And it, once again, I've, all my books have been optioned. Jane Campion's production company mm. did uh, Hungry Ghosts. Um, Joan Lindsay did my very first novel. I had um, a guy in England who went on to do Billy Elliot, optioned um, my 
third novel, which was called A Big Life. Um, the person uh, um, who did Wide Sagasso C and they did their production company did Babe, um, optioned Hungry Ghosts. So I've had lots and lots of almost runs. Uh, and nothing's come out of that. And with options comes money, right? Yeah, but they just, it's just token money. Like they oh, might right. give you an, a $1,000 for a year's option. Oh, okay. Or $500 for a year's option. Hmm. Um, so it's not, it's not a lot. Um, you know, it, t- it takes quite a lot, uh, you know, um, a lot to get a film up and running. Um, and, you know, you, if you know it had, had anything at all to do with the Australian film industry, it's really, really quite difficult hmm. to get a film up and, up and going. So what did you learn about that process? Uh, did you learn to not get your hopes up? Yeah. See, when you, so when you say about my first novel, you know, I thought, oh, my God, you know, all these fantastic reviews, all these fantastic, um, you know, uh, film options. I've got, I've made it. But in fact, you haven't, you know, like you haven't, um, you know, it's, it's really hard. You've made um, the first step on a climb up the mountain. Yeah, that's thing. right. That's right. right. You know, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's. Uh, you know, I mean, I I feel very happy that I've got my body of work now. I mean, it's eight novels actually, and ten books altogether. Like I've got two non-fiction books, one memoir, and a book on beauty. Um, and you know, I had a, a great piece of luck again with with my memoir because I I, I wrote that for six thousand dollars in Australia, but I I sold that to Simon and Schuster in New York for you know a hundred thousand, which at that that time. The dollar was the American dollar was worth double, so two hundred thousand mm. in 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 two thousand, the year two thousand, and was that, that was a lot like? of money. See, that's what I mean. Signing that was, that contract, that was a really yeah. wonderful moment. What did that do for your life? That amount of money. Well, it was. That's when we moved to England, right. you know, because I didn't have to pay tax on it. it. Was completely legal because I had, I was leaving in the tax year, which meant I we had to pay tax in England. But when I got to England, it was actually tax. Uh, it was seen as intellectual property work done in Australia. So it, 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 I didn't have to pay tax in either um, terrain, you know, mm-hmm. territory. And so basically that was enough money to, you know, launch us back in. Um, just to give you my a, a rundown of when I did go overseas, I went the first time just to Greece. But then when I went back, I got a scholarship to the Cité Internationale des Arts through the uh, Australia Council. So that was to Paris for six months and $10,000 in living money. Uh, but I met someone um, and ended up marrying them and going to Hong Kong. So I lived in Hong Kong for a couple of years. I went back to Paris after that marriage broke up. Um, I came back to Australia briefly, went back to London, um, came back to Australia again, lived in Melbourne for five years and worked briefly back at The Age for a couple of years. Hmm. That was the only time I went back to journalism. And then I went back to to, um, England for 10 years. So really for the best part of 20 years, I've lived a long time out of Australia. And during that 20 years, were you focusing on one novel at a time, one project, or were you trying to juggle several things? Yeah, no, no, no. I've always written one novel. I mean, my, my output is about a novel every three years. Um, and and some novels have been extremely difficult to research and write and have taken an awfully long time to get up. Um, and throughout those years I've had, I probably have had about three Australian Council grants. I've had, um, and people can't understand why writers still need Australian Council grants, but you know, it's it would, just so you know the breakdown of figures, you would know this, that, that um, writers get 10% of any a book sale so the rest is divided up between the publisher and the bookseller so 10% on a, a book that's worth $30 is $3 so you have to sell a lot of $3 books to make any serious money so that's that's how it works and so you really need to have a big prize like um, like for example Richard Flanagan has only now started to earn money as a, as a writer. Tim um, Winton has, has, has earned money from a, a long career. He won the Vogel pretty much from the outset and he's, you know, had great good fortune right from the beginning of his career. Mm. Um, and that's what you've got to have, you know, a, a big stroke of, of luck like um, Christos. Uh, he was working in a vet surgery for, you know, most of his... Christos Siokas. Yes. And it was, and then the slap just took off, um, and now he's 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 fine, mm. you know. But it's really really tricky to earn money 
um, from fiction writing in this country. Does that has that created anxiety in your life? Oh, huge anxiety. Tell me I mean, about it's that. just been well. You know, the last years in London were really tough because that's when the media landscape was changing entirely. And I mentioned to you before we started running that I could sell one piece one individual piece of journalism for $10,000. I'd sell the same piece to The Guardian UK, to the Sydney Morning Herald, and, and I would even rejig it slightly and sell it to a women's magazine, and I'd make $10,000. Towards the end of it, I, I was really struggling in London. I mean, you know, I could, I could sell occasional pieces. I did a few travel pieces for the Sydney Morning Herald. I did um, a few individual uh, stories for women's magazines in, Australia. I always, and I'll talk a bit about uh, advances because I think that's really important. I used to get $80,000 in advance for my books, um, which sounds a lot, but if you divide that by three years, if it takes you three years to do it, it's, or even if you take two years to do it, it's not a huge amount of money. Um, now, advances in Australia now, you're very, very lucky to get more than 10. I mean, I was lucky, I got a slightly, you know, I got, you know, closer to 20 but that we're talking about um, books that sell the same numbers now the advance is going down I mean I would have got eighty thousand dollars in advance you know for at least four books and now that's that's so it's not only publishing it's media new journalism it's changed as well and I've got many 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 friends in journalism who are really struggling hmm. you know the, the market has shrunk for um, Payments shrunk. So if if you do sell an article, I used to get a dollar a word. Now these days, it's it's some people are offering as little as thirty cents a word. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then that's if you can actually sell things. And and because of the proliferation of free material, there's a, there's a, a increasingly a feeling that you know you 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 great to get exposure. And sometimes people will try and say, you know, you're expected to give work for free. Which is just absurd. What other industry, what other industry is expected to work for free? I feel really passionate about this. Yeah. You know, everyone should join the Australian Society of Authors or the MEAA, and you know, join campaigns like Pay the Writers. You know, do everything you can to actively encourage as much payment as you can for the value of your work because it's a skill. It's something that takes years and years and years to hone and you should not be working for free. And anybody who asked you to work for free should be shamed and outed. Yeah, and the editors themselves who are asking to do that, they wouldn't work for free. Oh, absolutely. They, they're, they're on salaries. Absolutely. There's no way that they would be expected to work for free. And yet, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah, the writing itself, the content, as it's termed these days, is uh, the last uh, piece of the puzzle and the most important and yet... Absolutely. often devalued sadly absolutely absolutely and you know I always tell, to say that you know like like to use an example um, you know I'm paid very well as a, as a news limited journalist and you know the requirements of my job um, pale into comparing to writing a novel which you know so so you know the value is is um, inequitable I mean, it, there's an it, there's a inequity there about those two values, and increasingly in journalism, what you're getting is freelance journalism is not valued as much. So you know, there's a lot of salary journalists who are left, who and they're increasing too. Jobs in journalism are, 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 are shrinking, but I still argue that journalists are pretty well paid, and the editors are pretty well paid, and yet um, you know, contributors are getting shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. So it's becoming really hard for people, freelancers out there. So authors. Um, freelance journalists it's becoming you know there, there's a real divide now between salary journalists and freelance journalists okay so I'm fascinated by that 20 or so year period where you were writing novels exclusively tell me about your work rate during that time did you try to uh, follow a particular structure in your work days to try and encourage routine or did you follow your muse Wherever, no, no, whenever no, no. I don't think anybody follows, you know, who's a professional writer follows their muse. You know, you basically, um, you've got to get down and, and put your bum on the seat and work. Um, you know, I, 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 like a lot of writers, um, like to think that, um, it's a journey. I mean, I'm like D David Maloof. I, I agree that, that 
if you know where a book's going, you're going to be bored and the writer, the reader is going to be bored as well. I mean, I do like to just jump off. I mean, I can have a very, very loose idea of where I'm going. Um, but I think it's, you know, you get a, a kind of a much fresher book out that way. So you, but don't, you don't outline necessarily? Look, I, I don't. I'd like to get a first draft done. Mm. I mean, I, often I'll have the end already or often I'll have some sort of idea of where I'm going. Um, but no, I, I don't do sit down and do big outlines. I mean, a lot of writers do, but I don't. Um, I much prefer, you know, just it being an organic sort of creation. And then I'll do any sort of restructuring or any joining of the dots in subsequent drafts as I go along. Um, that's when you when you do editing is very important for someone like me. You know, that's when I'll do any of the, the, the you know the fixing up of stuff where where it doesn't actually work. Um, but you know, you've got to be very very. Uh, disciplined and any writer who's a professional is very disciplined I don't have any trouble people say oh god if I worked at home I'd be you know watching TV or I'd be lying in the Sun or I'd be watching you know like just reading that, that's not how it works I mean if you're actually working for money you and you're supporting yourself you've got to get the work done I mean I wouldn't get paid I wouldn't get any advances at all if I didn't do the work I mean what I can get lost in sometimes is research one of the things I loved about living in London is well the sense of history for a start but but I was a member of the London Library for a while but now it's gone up incredibly I think it's now about I don't know more than a thousand pounds a year in fees to join wow. but it wasn't when I was there but it, the London Library is set up by Carlisle and um, it's the the most it's in a lovely square in central London and it's got the best um, library anywhere it's got and you can take them home. You go. You're going home with books from 1823 in your bag. I mean, it's it's a lending library, which you you know, it's just extraordinary. And so I did for one of my novels. Um, spent a lot of time on gold fields because I've got a, um, a. I wanted to write a gold fields novel, and I spent a lot of time on early material about early migration to Australia about the 1850s. You know, free settlers. Um, and you know, I ended up not writing that novel at all. I think that became, I think that might have even become uh, my hundred lovers. I think I don't know. <laughs> so you know, like like quite often they they be, they they go you know veer in different places. Um, so it's not wasted time. It's not wasted it can time. Can be reused elsewhere. But but you know that's that's kind of the about the only time when I do you know meander a bit and you know but but that's kind of the dreaming time I think you do need a bit of dreaming time in, in novels um, you know where you actually dream in your way into into a book um, because you've got to, for, to have a novel you've got to have a lot of heft you can't it's different feeling to a sh short story I always say it's like you know first of all you're out in a in a in the shallows and you can feel the sand and everything but when you know you've got a novel is it's a feeling like you ride out and you've got a whole body of water be, 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 be uh, below you that that you know you can um, go in and swim in in indefinitely mm -hmm. and so you've got to get that feeling I remember when I was doing um, uh, the broken book in particular um, like for example when I had worked at the Sun Herald before I went to the Sydney Morning Herald um, they, in those days they had all their hard paper archives and I went in there and, and I'd always been a huge fan of Charmaine Clift who was um, George Johnston's wife and a writer in her own right, a very very beautiful writer and I knew she had, was a journalist and I knew she loved Greece, both things that I had in common with her and I, so I went in and, and photocopied all the Charmaine Clift documents. There were a lot of her original columns still there in hard, hard copy there was stories about her, there were stories about them when they went to Greece, there were every clipping about the Johnstons um, and Charmian. And I remember I carried around this stuff for years and years and years. Before I moved to London, I chucked it all. Mm. And I'm a great hoarder, so it was quite unusual. And then suddenly I'm in London in 2003, and I find myself writing about Charmian Clift, and I'd thrown all this stuff out. But I had it in my memory in some way. Um, so, you know, like it never goes to waste, ever. That you know, that, that kind of research and reading and just dreaming about something. Mm. You know, because I would have done that in 1982, 1981, I would have photocopied all that stuff, or even 1980. 
And so now I'm more talking about using that material in 2000 and, you know, three or something mm. like that. So it, that stuff never, ever goes to waste. Even though you end up, you know, writing something completely different, it's um, still incredibly useful. It just goes into some deep well that you kind of need for your work. During those days, whether you're at the library or at home writing a novel, how would you measure the success of a day? What was a good day versus a, a bad day for you? Well, I always do try um, and uh, have a thousand word limit. when I'm If I'm actually writing, it's a thousand word limit. Um, minimum? Minimum, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I, I started writing longhand with typewriters. You know, so I still had a, a typewriter when I started. Yeah, I was wondering about that, actually, the mechanics of writing pre-computers. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and also I used to, I think my first novel I wrote, I actually wrote my first novel in longhand. All my uh, material has been bought by the Mitchell Library in Sydney. And I, I definitely had a full scrap paper of longhand for that novel. And then uh, what I would do is write longhand during the day and in the morning, and then I've always I always work very well in the morning too. I, I'm not a late night person. How early? Um, you know, six o'clock is my perfect time to have be at the desk. Um, First thing when you wake up. Mm, yeah. Well, like no, I have a shower. I don't. I like to have a shower, have something to to eat, and then sit down fresh. Um, but I would like to, you know, six o'clock is my ideal time. Um, and then I would write longhand in the morning. I mean, see, I look back on that period and I think, that was just heaven. Uh, you know, before I was published, you're writing something. It was so exciting that you can actually write a novel. You know, it was so exciting. Um, and I had this little flat at Bondi. And I just look back on that time and I think, oh, that was just so perfect. Um, and then I would write it up, type it up in... Um, on the typewriter in the afternoon. That was my method of working. Mm. Longhand in the morning, type it up in, on the typewriter in the afternoon. And I would all, all sometimes make changes on the typewriter as I went along. And and then sometimes in the evening, because I was living by myself, I would e just look back on the typewriting pages and rewrite those. Um, and it's in some ways, I still know some people who, who still write on typewriters. Uh, and also know some people who write manually still by hand. Mm. Um, there are some benefits, uh, sometimes because your first thought is often the best thought. And if you're typing on a computer, sometimes you can erase, if you're erasing something, um, you can do undo, but sometimes if you've, if you've typed over something six times, you, your first thing is lost. Mm. So there are benefits in in a typewriter I've often thought I might I could go back to a typewriter too I mean I quite like the idea of going back to a typewriter mm. but but you know there's certainly fast it's fast speedier and don't forget we had no internet as well so if you wanted to research something you would have to go to a library you know you'd actually have to I spent a lot of time at the state library researching my second novel because I came back I ran out of money that's right in Sydney after my first novel came out I I was in a renting a place and they kept putting a rent up every six months and I was doing journalism and I was doing writing my second novel I had a grant and I had to move back to Queensland to my parents who had a beach place up in Karamundi and write there because I ran out of money so you ask about anxiety about money mm. many 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 times I've had anxiety about money and I've had to sacrifice an awful lot in order to be a writer. I don't have as much money as my friends. I don't have any superannuation to speak of. I have less than $100,000 in superannuation. I've had to sacrifice an awful, awful lot to be a writer. And I'm at the stage where I do sometimes think, you know, has it been, has, has that sacrifice paid off? Um, and that's what I mean about having to return to journalism at mm -hmm. the stage mm -hmm. of my career, I sometimes, think you know and it's pretty fatal if you look at you know where you are compared to you know Geraldine who who's done you know so brilliantly um, I don't begrudge I mean it's fan I, I couldn't write her books and she couldn't write mine I, I just can't write like that um, that's fine um, but you know I sometimes you know that, that, that I do now I'm at that sort of stage of my career where I think well you know was it worth it 
and then I, I, when I get to those moments, I think, well, yes, I have a body of work. I have a body of work. And that's what I've done, mm. you know. Um, so I generally think it's been good. But I certainly, you know, because I'm at the end of my, um, you know, working life, um, you know, in some ways, as a journalist, I mean, um, I do look around and see, you know, what I've got in financial terms compared to other people. So my measurement of, of success has always been different to kind of financial measurement, really. Mm. Um, I would have chosen to stay in journalism and, and you know, if, if I... If I was m- and most interested in money, if money was my kind of motivating factor, you would so, have been a career journalist. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah. That's right. Were your parents supportive of your career choices? Um, they were. My mother, who's not very educated, I mean, she she only went to, to school when she was six, to sixteen and hasn't got any tertiary education. Has been a great supporter and is a huge reader and very supportive. But Dad, when I moved to England, um, I remember him saying to my brother, "Well, look, I can imagine her wanting to be in England if she was like head of the Royal Bank of Scotland or you know she was transferred for something." But I can't understand why she's living there, you know. She couldn't really understand it. Whereas, you know, to be a writer in Europe, um, and especially in Paris, I've got a lot of links in Paris, spent a lot of time in Paris. My French is pretty appalling, but I do have, you know, a lot of links. And, you know, it means something to be a writer in, um, in France and even in England, really, to a certain extent. Although I think England also has a a deep anti-intellectual um, streak in it like Australia does but in Australia it's still not much job to be a writer I still arguably and I think I have pointed you in the direction of my essay that I that the speech I gave to the National Library of Australia I still think arguably you're still treated with a bit of suspicion in Australia you're still seen as a bit of a wanker if you're a writer right you yeah. know I, I, I think arguably um, you know I still think uh, look at Brandis and the arts. You know, just just the, the, the what's been happening lately. That, that George you know, Brandis, George Brandis, uh, who's the, who's the recently deposed arts minister. But just that sort of feeling that that all these people are getting away with something in small companies, or they you know who who's listening to them or who's watching them, and and you know in some way, do they deserve to have public funding? And you know, I've noticed myself a couple of times. I've got into. Um, I, I've, I've been involved at, when I came back f- uh, to Australia. One of the things I wanted to do was get involved in the kind of national dialogue about um, identity and who we are and art the, and, and uh, the general discussion about what's happening in Australia um, culturally and you know as, as, as making up our identity. So I became involved pretty much directly as soon as I came back with with. Um, Campbell Newman's axing of the Premier's Prize. So myself, Matt Condon, and a, a whole group of other uh, writers became involved with the Queensland Premier's Prize. So when Ana- Anastasia Palaszczuk, the new incoming Labor uh, Premier, reinstated the prize, I mean, it's not called the Queensland Premier's Prize, but she's actually put money towards it again. Um, I I wrote an article on the Korea Mail um, website and w- which went into the print edition just applauding that decision and the num the vitriolic comments that came out in comments about and someone actually saying well I can report that this Susan Johnson person has been is supported by the Australian taxpayer several times in arts funding um, decisions and you know I did declare that on the bottom of my of my article anyway mm. um, but the vitriol about any public money going to support artists in this country is still out there and was really, really surprising to me. Mm. Yeah, it's a shame. And probably there's a bias in internet commenters who are generally wasting time at work and perhaps negative in their mindset to begin with. So you don't hear the perhaps silent majority who agree, only the people who decide to write comments are heard in that situation and unfortunately the culture of the internet means that they are often negative. Yes, that's right. That's right. Mm. But it was it was a shock because um, I, I've got a, a friend who um, has has been the recipient of a number of grants, you know, through the seventies and eighties and he's he's he see this is you you say about confidence. He's a bloke. He he he'll get fifty 
50 cents out of his pocket and put it down on the table if he's had a, a conversation with people who say, oh, you know, I don't think arts, artists should be supported. He'll get 50 cents out, put it on the table and say, there you go, mate. There's your, there's your 50 cents. Um, that, that represents, you know, your, your, your 10 years of tax. Um, you know, to to me as a, as an artist over the, the yeah, years, you can have I mean, it back. yeah, that's right. You can have it back. <laughs> I, I I wouldn't couldn't do that. I mean, I I find I I find it quite difficult to to do that myself. But um, you know, it, it's it's certainly there. That there's still, I think, arguably, a level of hostility in Australia towards artists. What do you think can be done to combat that? Um. Look, it's really interesting. I, I think that you know, the more success we have internationally, I suppose, um, is a good thing. But you, you you hear people tearing down, you know, um, Naomi uh, Watts, um, uh, Kate Blanchett, um, Nicole Kidman, um, to say nothing of Baz Luhrmann. Um, you know, Australia is tricky. It's, it does have that tall poppy syndrome as well, doesn't it? On the one hand, we you know we love saying our oh, our Hugh or our Kylie, but then there's also a kind of um, hostility to people. You know, the tall poppy thing. People who get too big for their boots. It's a really tricky one. Um, I spoke to Barry Humphreys, who was out here just recently, um, at um, doing other things, but he was launching. Tim Storyer's exhibition, and um, they've been friends for years. And um, I had a brief chat with him about whether he thinks the climate has changed. I mean, because he's been the um, director of the Adelaide Festival, he's come out to do that. And he says yes. I mean, obviously, huge changes since the fifties when he was um, when he left Australia, but. You know, he, he, he agreed that there's still, you know, some kind of um, feeling about artists in this country. What do you do about it? I'm not sure. I mean, I guess it'll only change over time as more as, as, as the kind of um, makeup of Australia changes, I guess, mm. um, as more of that kind of old yobbo kind of Australian dies out, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's almost a devaluing of creativity in a way it's um denying the difficulty of creating something from scratch whether that's a book or a film or a magazine article like these are difficult tasks and they're highly specialized only a few people can do them and it takes a lot of courage to uh first think you're good enough to do it and then second to deliver on that um promise and yeah for someone to put years of their life into a piece of work and then to have some fuckwit internet commenter saying this is shit. Oh, well, why you know, why the, the Australia Council give well, them the money? Well, thi- the thing was, you know, people would say things like, "Well, I've written a few poems. Will they give me some money?" Or, you know, so so you think, well, they've got no understanding. That's exactly right mm. of, of devaluing creativity. Or they'd say, "Oh, well, I want to go out and you know do up old cars. Why won't someone give me some money for that?" Mm. You know, they really, really don't. So it is a devaluing of creativity. I think that's mm. a very good argument to say that. That's right. They just don't understand the process at all. And, you know, I always tell that story of Mar- Margaret Atwoods. She says she was at a party somewhere with some guy who'd never heard of Margaret Atwood. I don't know how you could not have heard of Margaret Atwood, but he hadn't. And they were having a conversation. He was a brain surgeon. And, and he said, oh, you know, what do you do? And she said, oh, well, I'm a writer. You know, I'm a fiction writer. And he said, oh, that's, you know, that's funny because I've been thinking that I might, you know, write something myself these days. And she said, that's funny. I was thinking I might do a spot of brain surgery one day. You know, the C's, she's Margaret Atwood. She can say that. But, you know, yeah. I just... And uh, Anna, Anna Enright, the, the uh, Booker Prize winner, also tells us some her- terrible story in the London Review of Books about meeting some sort of moneyed up um, uh, Irish type in um, Dublin, you know, who'd, who'd also never heard of Anne Enright, who's won the Booker Prize, and having some discussion uh, again of, of a similar similar nature. So maybe it's not a peculiarly Australian thing. Mm. Um, I don't know. You know, it would be interesting to find out. I mean, I think it. I think possibly, you know, that that it exists everywhere, except maybe France. Um, you know, or Italy, um, you know, there may be some places where, where you know, but I, th- I think there's definitely an anti-intellectual streak in England and Ireland, and also Ireland, that, be, you know, you're too big for your boots, tall poppy thing. I think Australia really gets that from Ireland. Hmm. And who do you think you are? 
you know, that's really Irish. I've had a number of discussions with Irish friends of mine about that. It's very, and Australia's got a really big history of Irish, um, you know, Bolshe Irish in it. <laughs> My heritage is Irish. Mm. McMillan is an Irish name. So yeah. I know yeah. exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Coming towards the end, um, tell me about that decision to come back to the Courier Mail or the uh, series of events that led you coming back here to the place where you began your career. Well, what happened was in 2010, my father was dying, my mother was looking after her mother who had dementia, and my marriage was imploding. So there were a sort of, um, it was a perfect storm of events. I was running out of money as well. Um, I was finding it increasingly hard. I was in a marriage where my husband, uh, ex-husband, um, felt it was he oh, just just as a bit of background he was a journalist but he was also a drummer jazz drummer and he felt it was increasingly unfair that I was being allowed to pursue my artistic self when he couldn't just go off and be a jazz drummer and so um, you know I, I, I had to borrow money from friends to put into my um, into the marriage because I was expected to bring in some you know an X amount of dollars and twice I had to borrow money from friends um, to put into my marriage because I didn't have enough money. So it was pretty dire. We're talking a very, very dire set of circumstances. So um, I basically decided my only way out was to try and get um, some um, job in Australia. And my husband said, if we come back to Australia, you're the one who's got to earn the money because I've done my fair share of earning the money. So um, that was the, the kind of thing that was put to me, that I had to find a job. The only job, it was very humiliating, I had to write and ask everybody I had ever known in my whole or entire professional career, including people who had interviewed me mm. at various, it was really humiliating to see if I could get a job. The only job I could get uh, was at the education department as on the media crisis management team. I was completely out of my depth. I'd never done anything before like that. I had to, you know, I'd never worked in the public service, so I had to work really, really hard to find out how the public service worked and its approval systems and, you know, massaging um, all these people in the in public service. So, but I was very grateful to have a job. So I came out ahead of everybody else. Um, I soon realised that. Um, you know, but the, the children stayed to, to finish their education. I soon realised that it was going to be really hard for me to uh, continue in the marriage if we, if we um, you know, moved back in together. So, you know, it was very, very acrimonious divorce, so I'll slide over all that. Then, after about a year in uh, the education department, Matt Condon uh, became the editor of Q Weekend. And Matt... And I actually, I published Matt's first short story ever right. in Latitudes, and that was my first publication as well for the University of Queensland Press. Mm -hmm. I was the editor, and I also published my first story in that. So Matthew Condon and I were launched onto the world in the same year, in the same publication, which was Latitudes, New Writing from the North, published by University of Queensland Press in 1986. Um, so Matt and I have also shared a lot of our careers over the years in that, that he has, has published fiction while working as a journalist. Um, I was on the judging panel once uh, for the Steel Rudd Award the year we awarded it to Matt for one of his very fine books. Um, and I've always been a huge fan of his fiction. I think he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful fiction writer and I hope he writes another book of fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I also think he's done wonderful work, of course, with um, with this brilliant trilogy um, about those years of corruption in Queensland. But when Matt, um, when I heard that Matt was um, in the editor's chair, I immediately fired off an email and said, Matt, uh, is there any chance whatsoever that I can have a job? I had actually applied many, many times over those um, the last few years in for a job on this magazine because there's not many jobs for, for journalists like me in Queensland. Mm. Uh, there's not many jobs in journalism in Queensland, you know, and I wanted to come back to Queensland because of my family situation. Um, so a miraculously, a mir miracle of miracles, there was actually a job going. So I got um, on under Matt's um, uh, editorship and, you know, got this job, which I'm very, very grateful to have. Of any job that, you know, I, I could have in, in journalism, this is it. 
Um, but, you know, at, at the same time, it, you know, again, it was kind of hard to come back to the Courier Mail. I mean, this magazine didn't exist when I worked here before. Obviously, it's a new thing. But um, so that's how I ended up back here. Um, and, you know, in, in some ways it's been, you know, as, as I said, quite tricky. But it's also, you know, if I'm going to work anywhere, this is where I want to be working. Does your journalism work feed into your fiction? Does one help the other? Is it a circular sort of process? Yeah, I think sometimes it does. You know, like, for example, I did a lovely story. I love these these fi- families. Um, in Greek Australians, and gr- particularly Greek Catherian Australians, from Kithra, which is the, the largest island south of the Peloponnese, Brisbane, Australia, has a lot of Catherians. And I went to school with Maria Komonos, who was our school captain when I was at... Um, Playful College, and she's been a, a long-time friend of mine. And in fact, that's where I went to Kithra when I went, had my year in Greece. That kind of, uh, in this novel, I've got a lot of Catherian Greeks. Um, so it does, in a way. I mean, I did the story of the lovely Bellas family, who are very big in in, in Brisbane. Um, that was a story I did for Q Weekend. So yes, I think there are things. I mean, I do a lot of interviews with artists, which I just adore. Mm. Visual art is a big thing for me. I love Australian visual art. So I've, I've had the great honour and privilege of interviewing Davido Allen, uh, William Robinson, um, John Olson. You know, it's been a real privilege to interview artists of those calibres and, and to actually get the privilege of going into their working studios. So that's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I've got an, a frustrated artist in my book. Um, so, you know, I do write about visual artists quite a lot. So that's been that's been great. Mm. So it does feed in in some ways, yes. And in the redesigned QE Cans recently, you've got this column, Relative Values, is that what it's called? Where you uh, try to find people who, who are related to have interesting stories to share. Yeah, that's right, and and so that's been that's been kind of interesting too because you know obviously I'm a uh, character is one of the great pulls for me in journalism and in fiction. I think everything is character based really. Like you know, ca- through character you can tell the, the the history of the world, can't you? Like let's look at H- Hitler, let's look at you know Margaret Thatcher, let's look at Chamberlain. You know, like these Tony these Abbott. are Tony Abbott. Absolutely, you know, it really you can know everything through through character and history and. You know, so I think it's so fascinating. Campbell Newman, you know, these are Joe Bilkey Peterson. You know, these are the great stories. Um, so in, in some ways, it's, it's a real privilege to do that. Okay, last question. You've, uh, you spoke earlier about, I think it was Norman Mailer's view, where each piece of work that you create is adding another brick to the wall of art. Where do you think the landing fits amongst your your wall that you've built so far or the wall of other writers who have created novels? Um, Look, I I wanted the landing to be a a, a sort of um, a comedy of manners but but I wanted to be sort of almost glancing. It's been... Coming back to Queensland, it's it's, it's good as an observer to look at certain idiosyncratic things of Queensland like it's um, you know where you go to school and all that kind of crap and stratty and you know there's a whole lot of stuff I've it's a sort of you know, it's mild satire but I I hope I'm kind of you know putting a little bit of a pin in the middle class of Brisbane because it's been kind of interesting to look at but um, it's interesting because my agent Zeke Geist uh, Media who's Ben Law's agent as well um, uh, they're, they're based in Sydney and Brussels and I was really keen to see the French-speaking Brussels agent, Sharon Gallant, um, have a look at the landing, and she's taking it to Frankfurt next month, just how she got all that. And she said she didn't have any trouble at all with all those kinds of things that I, that I thought might be a bit difficult for a, a non Australian reader to get. So she sort of thought that was all translatable um, and recognisable to, you know, whether it's a, you know, kind of beach community outside New York or outside San Francisco or, you know, down outside London, you know, in um, Suffolk or somewhere like that. Mm. So that's been kind of heartening to, to, you don't really know really until it gets become international. I've been published, most of my novels are published outside of Australia and some are in translation in France and Hungary and um, a few other countries like that. Um, so let's see, you know, how it goes when it, you know, is reviewed internationally. You know, I think that's probably the only test. But in terms of whether I'm satisfied with it or not, um, you know, you always like every 
next novel is going to be, you know, the, the next one, the one, yes. Yeah. So, so let's see. You know, I, I, I still want to write again. I was very lucky that I got a six, uh, a, a six month leave of work because I got another um, uh, Australian Council grant to write this book. Um, so it's kind of how do I negotiate any more time off, really? That's the next question for me. And writing another novel. Thanks for talking to me, Susan. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Penmanship and thank you to my guest, Susan Johnson. If you'd like to see show notes for this episode, including links to Susan's writing, you can visit penmanshippodcast.com. The name of my weekly email newsletter that I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast is Dispatches. And the theme music that you hear throughout Penmanship is Eternally Yours by Laughing Clowns. Thanks for listening. Till next time.